It's the My First Gig Podcast, whoa, sharing stories of first gigs and shows, comedian sharing their memories, the fun and entertaining, exciting and crazy, with Dwayne Dugan as your host, it's the My First Gig Podcast, here we how are you folks? What's the crack? Welcome to the My First Gig Podcast. My name is Dwayne Dugan and thank you for joining me for episode three. We've made it. Wow. Three episodes. That's a big milestone, isn't it? It's like almost double what we did last week with two. Thank you so much for joining us for Ardla Hannon last week. I really loved last week's episode. Listening back afterwards in the edit, I didn't realise how much I'd forgotten since, since we recorded the interview, how much he spoke about Dublin and living here in Dublin. I just really loved hearing about it, so I don't know if you're from if you're from Dublin or you're from elsewhere, maybe you painted in a nice picture of just simpler times, nicer times. You know, Ireland in the eighties, it wasn't wasn't all it's cracked up to be. You know, it's a it's a big city now, Dublin. We've got companies from all over the world, we've got people from all over the world, we've got things to do, things to see. But, you know, in the eighties it was I wasn't I won't even say grey. In the eighties it was brown. Brown Ireland, everything was just brown. Clothes were brown, cars were brown. The sky was, I look, I was barely there in the eighties. I'll be honest. I'm recounting this from probably two photographs that I've seen, but I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. My guest today is the wonderful Reginald D. Hunter. If you don't know who he is, you'll certainly recognise him from you know just years and years and years on UK panel shows and television, whether it be Have I Got News for You, Eight Out of Ten Cats. QI, Live at the Apollo, Would I Lie to You, you name it, he's been on it. It's a shorter chat than usual. If you enjoyed the first two episodes and the first episode clocked in about 50 minutes, and you're like, wow, yeah, I want 50 minutes of this every week. And then the, the next week it's 10 minutes shorter. And then tonight you're like, where's my episode? I had every intention of like capping these at a certain time. But it turns out people recount different things or want to share different things when, when we talk about their first gig. Because that's why I did this chat. Hope Generally asking them about quite literally the moments before they got on stage for that first time. They're recounting memories and kind of incidents that aren't coming up when you talk about, you know, their successes or their highlights and stuff like that. So it's come to the point now that if a comedian only chats for, you know, for 20, 25 minutes, then we'll just chat for 25 minutes. If they chat for 45 minutes, we'll chat for 45 minutes. So that's me chucking any responsibility I have of keeping this on time completely out the window. That sounds sounds like a great plan that I have there, you know, and like, oh, just let them go. Let them run. Run, Reginald, run. But no, it's actually just me looking back at the edits and be like, there's absolutely no consistency here at all. I could either start cutting out 20 minutes of people's chats. I could start... You know, trying to do impressions of them. And look, I'm not going to start doing impressions of people. No matter how much you tweet me and ask. My first American guest. That's that's substantial, isn't it? Look how international we are. We've got comedians from all over the world. And only three episodes in. Milestone after milestone after milestone. But I guess that's, that's the kind of stroke you got when you're a world-famous podcaster, kid. Speaking of America, it was Martin Luther King Day this weekend. And I know this because there was tributes across Twitter from different people, one of which being the FBI. The FBI tweeted out saying, Happy Martin Luther King Day. He was a good lad, right? And that's just some lad there. That's Mickey the intern behind the desk, you know, putting that out. And he was just inundated with responses being like, After what you did, telling Martin Luther King to commit suicide? Which... I'll admit, seeing that, I was like, hold on, stop right now, what are you talking about? And it turns out this is a big thing, I've been reading up on it, some lad in the FBI back in the 60s sent a letter to Martin Luther King encouraging him and suggesting that he was done and that's the only thing that he had left to do. After sending his wife a lot of tapes proving that he cheated on her, like, don't cheat on her, but don't be the FBI and then just being like, here, your husband's up to stuff. That's not what I expect of the FBI. I don't really know what I expect of the FBI. I know them primarily from Netflix shows. Probably not a correct description. In fact, the only thing I know about Martin Luther King is from U2 songs. I'm not a very knowledgeable man. 
but I've been reading up about this. And this guy, William Cornelius Sullivan, sent him a letter. But, like, as the FBI. Like, if I send a letter, I'm just madman who's sending people letters. Like, if I send these kind of letters, not in general. It's not like, hey, you're sincerely madman. But this guy was able to, like, be as the FBI. And he was just some lad. Bill, don't be doing that, Bill. You know, I don't walk into McDonald's and say, can I get three hamburgers with just ketchup? And they say, that's too many hamburgers, you fat bastard. No, they say, of course you can. Thank you. See you next time. Love you lots. McDonald's. But he's just, you know, he's just a regular guy. He's no different than Mickey the intern, you know. I read up about him then. He died then from an accidental gunshot. Not saying he deserved it. But, you know, things kind of worked themselves out. He was walking, apparently he went to meet up with some lad to write about his boss, Hoover. Which, when I was reading this, I'd skip down to this part. So I didn't know, when they just said Hoover as an abbreviation, I thought they just meant he wanted to write a book about a Hoover. And I was thinking, what a way to go. Hey, gonna write this book. What? Bang. Ah. Oh. Oh, now I'll never get to reveal what those little attachments actually do. Oh. But he got shot by some lad, some young kid, who said he thought he was a deer. So this Cornelius fella, who's telling Martin Luther King, you're done, apparently he looks like a deer. Because your man said he shot him in the neck. That's where you're meant to shoot a deer. So it's not like a lucky dip. I thought I saw a deer behind the fence, shot him and then got him in the chest. And this guy who shot him anyway, they just said, give us 500 quid as a fine and we're going to take away your license for 10 years. So you're no longer allowed to hunt FBI lads. You know, that's conspiracy, isn't it? Taking out the people who are looking into the FBI. Just saying. I don't know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying though. You're saying, what are you talking about, Dwayne? Where's Reginald D. Hunter? And look, fair enough. Maybe we should get into it. It's a great chat recorded at the Kilkenny Cat Last Festival. He had literally just come off stage, straight there in the venue, sat down, started having a chat. Great story. It's now time, about time, for my first gig with Reginald D. Hunter. Um, uh, th- that they like me. <laughs> <laughs> First uh, and foremost. It's easier to like anybody if they like you. Sure. And, um, and um, we've had sort of a, a ongoing... On again, on again relationship. So yeah, it's 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 uh, and, and and particularly this trip, you know, I'm I'm using this trip to get well. It's like um, I just come from South Africa, and you know, they, they can be a little tense. Yeah. And before that, I hadn't done much stand up, and it was like I just I needed to come get dipped in this Irish sauce before I go. And and I've had like two gigs a night for the last two three nights, and they've been all pretty bouncy and rollicking. And I'm ready to go the rest of my schedule now. This is just this is. This is a fortuitous bounce. Back to match fitness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you find it hard to come back after a break? So I need two to three gigs in a row. Sure. And you, know, you need, um, I, I found that I need, and you still may remember your jokes. Yeah. You might be between your old jokes and your new jokes, but it takes a moment for something in your body to go, oh, I remember how to do this. How to do it, the, yeah. yeah. the pilot light comes on like, oh, I, re- I remember how I say things now. <laughs> and uh, how have you found the crowds? We're to kill Kenny Cat laughs. How have you found the crowds this weekend? Um... Plentiful, bouncy, um, able to handle heat and sweat real good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a su- it's a sunny weekend here, which we're not too used to. But yeah, yeah, we got we got a break this time. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, obviously, it's not your first time at Cat Laughs. No, no, no. And but a lot of people coming here for the first time, certainly outside of Ireland, they walk up and down these streets, and they they're a bit stunned as to how International Comedy Festival has survived and thrived <laughs> here for so many years. Would you come across many festivals like this on little small um, towns? Uh this is I mean, there's a lot of there's a, there's some notable festivals in the world uh, cat last being one of them um uh, and there's a lot more comedy situations that aspire to be festivals or call themselves festivals or soon will be <laughs> but um this is this is the most easygoing festival it's like um it's not like a festival where like uh, say montreal where you're trying to like um 
get a TV deal, hopefully sure. being seen. And it's, it's a very networking kind of festival. Um, the Edinburgh Festival is more of a festival where you put where you're putting your shingle out. He's like, I think enough of my comedy. I'm going to spend the money necessary to pay for my, a theater and accommodation to demonstrate my wares. Sure. Cat laughs. You know, it's like, hey, we got a room for you. Your gig's over here. We're drinking over here afterwards. <laughs> What's hard about that? And then they pay you. You see the people walking <laughs> up and down the streets. It's yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very nice. Before we get into your first gig, I want to try and go back and see. Would you have any memory of what your first kind of realization of comedy or humor would be? When that kind of maybe entered your yeah, life? That's, that's, that's an unusual question. I was, uh, thank you. I, was just, uh, I appreciate it. Just, you know, I used to get um, relentlessly routine questions when I get like really crazy ones. That was, that was, that was a good one. Now. Hmm. Your woman will appreciate you <laughs> as a listener. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> my first, my first uh, memory of comedy or real, realization of humor or something that uh, you know, as yeah. a child. Yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> you put that. Your it depends how long it took you to realize it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just, I, I, my earliest thing I remember laughing at was Popeye. Okay. And you know, it's just, and I, I've been thinking about it recently. Just the violent nature of the cartoons that I and I saw growing up, and it was just that was humor, and. For America in the 1950s, that sort of, you know, smash a pie in the guy's face or uh, bust a bottle over his head, that was humor. Yeah. And it's like, wow, it's just, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> what about actual live comedy then? When would you have first experienced, you know, actually oh. being in a room and seeing seen comedy? Oh, the first time I, um, I went to New York to audition for Rada so I could come to uh, London. And I was with my cousin in New York, and she said, you're in New York for the first time. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I had heard of the comedy store. Sure. And I said, uh, I'd like to go to the comedy store. And so we went. And we went, and we watched 16 comedians that night, <laughs> and they were all just terrible. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I can do as well as that. <laughs> and just tucking that in my mind. And then I, I did the audition, and then a couple of months later, I, I got... Um, I got acceptance into Rada, and then I came to Rada. And about a year later, after I left Rada, when I was kicking around Birmingham, I remembered what was the last thing I was thinking before I was going to do this acting bullshit. <laughs> oh, I remember last thinking if I did, if I went to do some stand up, I'd at least be as good as those sixteen cats I saw. And so, yeah. And was that a thing that you pursued it then to to see if you could do better, or how well, did you fall into yeah, that first gig? I. Um, <laughs> I I did it as a one-off, thinking, you know, hey, you know, I'll just, I'll say, I'll be be able to put this in the adventures of Reginald. Sure. I had like a journal that I was keeping. Like a skydive or something. Yeah, yeah, you know. And it turned out, it went really well. And uh, I was surprised how well I thought on my feet because I didn't have any jokes written. I didn't realize I didn't have any jokes until the man called my (laughs) name. And I was like, shit, I ain't got no jokes. And I came up with like two or three decent ones. I was just off, off the cuff. And it was like, I left that thinking, wow, I might have some aptitude for this. Were you the funny guy growing up? The kind of the class clown, anything like that? <laughs> it depends on who you ask. I was making jokes all the time. It's debatable whether or not I was the funny guy. <laughs> um, my sister, you were trying at least. My yeah. sister found it annoying. <laughs> but I mean, it was like, I grew up in that, um, I, I got hold of that sort of Saturday Night Live, late night, um, Mad Magazine kind of thing. And just, and I just, I like goofy humor and just, it seemed to me from the background that I came from, the, um, the, a lot of ethnic humor was, was, was very angry. And, and, and I understand the anger. I just couldn't understand why anger couldn't be goofy. <laughs> okay, interesting. I could go back to those, those early <laughs> cartoons nearly. <laughs> so how did that first gig come about? Did you, did you like, seek it out? Or did you... I, um, I was in a bar one night. I was in, a, in this pub in Birmingham, and uh, I saw this sign. That, uh, this guy was next to me, and he said, um, I was, I was cracking jokes. I was just off the cuff and just, I was drunk. I was being, I was bitching a little bit. Uh, um, I had just gotten sacked from this, um, what do you call it? This, uh, job I had, uh, pantomime job. I had a pantomime job and I just gotten sacked because I had mouth off at the guy that ran the gig, but he didn't pay us and he was really, anyway. And I was venting in this club and this pub one night drinking and there was about eight, nine people in and they were all pissing themselves and that was spurring me on, of course. 
And then someone said, mate, 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 you should do the comedy here every Tuesday. And they point to the sign and they said, comedy here every Tuesday. And I looked at it and I thought, maybe. And I thought, maybe. And so I called a guy like a, the next day and I said, hey, I'd like to come down and do your club. And he said, he says, he says, are you a professional comedian? I said, nope, never done it. He says, you've never performed before? I said, nope. He said, are you funny? And I said, I think so, but that's what I want to find out. And then he said, well, we only normally hire professional comedians. And then he says, are you American? I said, yeah, does that help? And he said, come on down and let's see. And I turned up, and I don't know what criteria he used other than eyeballing me to decide yes or no. But he said, okay, I'll give you 10 minutes. And I went and did 10 minutes, and it turned out pretty good. And afterwards, he um, <laughs> he said, I don't normally do this, but he slapped like 10 quid in my hand. And I was so broke. <laughs> there you go that's first page show so, I mean, right off know, the bat I took this as a good omen <laughs> <laughs> I'd usually ask how, how you'd approach writing for that first gig when uh, it's something that you know you'd never written for before but as you said you didn't write anything you just went up and Tevin a yeah. long time with no material yeah I'm just I mean th- there's no one way to come to this I mean there's so many comedians that come from so many different fields and walks of life people come from from, from, from theology from teaching from the legal profession you know just it's, and I find that a lot of people who write a lot in, in advance of their first show often tend to people that believe in the maximum preparation for it. And it's, I often try not to give comedians, young comedians advice um, before the first five years because you just have to go feel it. You have to go feel it. And you have to, and, and I think you spend those first five years determining what kind of funny you are, sure. whether it's slapstick funny, or political funny, whatever. And you also spend that, those five years working out what feels right to you, whether writing right up until a gig or stopping five hours before and making sure you don't think about it at all. Uh, or what gets you in the, it's like, you're trying to figure out what is it that thing that you do, those, those times that you've made people crack themselves up. You're trying to distill what that is and transfer that from the classroom or with your mates, and you're trying to put it on stage, and you're trying to summon it to a deadline. <laughs> and everybody's way to that is different. So you mentioned that you went to you auditioned to go to RADA, and you'd had pantomime jobs. What 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 like kind of put you towards acting or performing? So like there was obviously performance before comedy. Man, I just I just think acting. I just. I felt like all those years of watching TV needed to pay off in some kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, a, I was a very unsupervised. Kid. If you could call it studying, isn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a very unsupervised get kid in the seventies, and so I watched a lot of television, a lot of late night television that maybe eight year eight year olds shouldn't see. And but I, I'm, I feel the better for it. And it was just, I had this teacher at my school that um, some days it seems like he liked me, and some days he didn't. And I'd done, I'd, I'd done the lead role in a play, and I just finished, and I come off stage, and everybody was like, "Right, that was great, that was great." And then he came up to me and he said, "Pretty soon we have to find out if you're really an actor or just a mimic." <laughs> That's quite an intimidating, probably at that, at that stage, but it also spur you on. Do you think the, that that background helped you when you started coming? Well, I mean, I think he asked a legitimate question. I mean, I just, I just think he asked it cuntily. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's 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 um it's like there comes a point I think if you're a performer, uh it interests you to know what no matter what you choose to believe or say you believe is to the authenticity of your work. Sure. How much of it is 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 original, uh how much of it is derivative, how much of it and what is the point meeting between? And it's like yeah, it's like you know, I find myself asking sometimes, you know, it's like you know, am I really the, the the individual voice that I think that I am, or am I just feeling a type? I, I mean, I'm, I'm am I my generation's type that does this type of thing? And it's like you know, there's just stuff stuff I wonder. Especially this weekend, that there's a lot of people who, who I've spoken to have come from studying acting or some form of performance before they started comedy, and there's been different answers, pro and against it. How do you think that that background helped or? Maybe it didn't help you. I don't know, man. I've been you're about the millionth person that asked me that, and I don't. I, I don't know what people be looking for when they ask me that. I don't know. I'm just. Uh, <laughs> uh. So I think some, sometimes people can say like, "Oh, well, you know, the traits that they learned in acting kind of put up a little bit of a wall that they overcome, or maybe 
you know, being comfortable I on stage. I can see that. I can see that. Like positive. I, I can see that. But it was like, um, in the, in, apart from my acting training, which probably helps me project. <laughs> um, beyond that, I have genuinely like people. And I think what I like being a, a stand up over an actor is as a, as a comedian, you get to interact with your audience as you're performing. Whereas if you're an actor, you may not even be present when people are enjoying sure. your work. You get that instant gratification. Yeah. Well, it's not. Well, hopefully. Even, well, I mean, instant gratification carries such a kind of connotation now. Like you're such a person of ill and weak character because you like, you, you, you like or need a need immediate gratification. And it's, uh, I guess you could say immediate gratification, but immediate I, response, perhaps. Well, it's not even that. I just like people, hmm. <laughs> and it's just, and it's, it's, it's the time of day where I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody's bad son. I'm not uh, nobody's employer. I'm not anybody's father. I mean, it's, it's, it's these are people who just like you, <laughs> just enjoy, and it's just, and it's real and it's electric, and it's like you get that, and you go, oh, okay, all right. There's a reason for getting out of bed and doing this. And it's just, and put it this way. I find that people who genuinely mean the best towards you are always, you can, they're always visibly happy to see you. Like, hey, it's you! Just, and when you was a baby, you walk in your room, your mom would be like, there's my baby! Just, just, and it's, yeah. It's sincere. Yeah. It's that. The people who are happy to see you. So that night, nice, those Tuesdays in Birmingham, what, what was the venue? Uh, the Bear Tavern. Bear Tavern. And before you went up, do you remember what you were feeling? Like, you know, I guess you, you've signed up for this. I remember fe- I remember feeling when I called the man, like, please, 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 please. And then he said, yes. And I was like, yes, yes, my destiny continues. <laughs> <laughs> ha, ha, ha. And then uh, slowly as, I, I, and, I, and then the gig came around and I got dressed and everything and I went there. And then I sat there in the audience and it was like, I was just digging it and everything. And it was only when he started saying my name, it was like my voice said, you don't have any jokes. I was like, I, I genuinely... Hadn't thought to prepare anything. It's so boneheaded. <laughs> and I, so I was walking to the stage and I was feeling like this. I'm like, okay. And I, and I instinctually knew this. I actually thought to myself, I need to have an opening line, an interesting a, a, a introductory joke that sort of says hello in a way that's funny. And I, I knew that. And I came up and I, and I came up with something and it worked. <laughs> Do you remember what it was? Yeah, it was a whole throwaway. It was a whole stupid joke where I said, how you doing? Um, I know I'm odd. Um, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm I'm still rebelling against my family. Um, um, uh, I do things that they don't want me to do because uh, I don't like them. Uh, that's why I, I, remember, I remember once when I joined the Ku Klux Klan, and I went into the whole thing about when I joined the Ku Klux Klan out, out of rebelling against my family, and it got a big laugh. And it's probably the one joke. If that joke had not gone well, <laughs> I might not have had a good rest of the set. Sure, and I might not have had. The, the thought that, hey, I'm going to do this. That guy might not have given me 10 quid afterwards. Yeah. But <laughs> that joke <laughs> is... <laughs> but I, I think, yeah, people always, they're a lot more settled when they get that first laugh. But that's not just the first laugh of a gig or any gig. That was, that was the first laugh that's now, you know, spurred in a career. Baseball pitchers in America, they say, I spend the first, first or second inning just figuring out what the umpire wants it at. Where you wanted that, man? I throw it here. I throw it there. You like it over there? Well, I'll stay out there all night. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with what they like. <laughs> so you did that as a once-off, you said. Or at least you planned to. Yeah. What What led to the second gig, to the third gig, um, and so on? Uh, I got phone calls. Um, what happened? Um, in that audience were two guys that ran another gig. And they got in touch and they said, we can only pay you 30 quid. And I was like, sold. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third gig I did... Um, this guy from Liverpool rang and he said, uh, I got the show and I heard, I heard about you. I really like for you to come close it. And I said, Hey, close it. I don't. And before I could speak, he says, I can only pay you 170 quid. And I said, what time? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a, it's a big moment for comedians when they finally get their first paid gig. <laughs> your big moment was probably your first unpaid gig. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. But see, I was, I, I was, I was, and I was near starving when I, when I started stand up. So I was like, you're going to pay me to, yeah, okay. And, but by the time the 170 pound kid came around, I had my first semblance of a set. And, and then there was a guy in that audience, uh, of, 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 of Jeff Whiting, uh, comedian and promoter. Yeah. And he saw me and I've been working ever since.
There you go, fair play. If you could go back, is it the Bear Tavern, you say, in Birmingham, mm-hmm. and right before your name is about to be called, right before you have that realisation that you don't have jokes, if you could just pull yourself aside and say something to you then and there that day, what do you think you'd say now looking Nothing. back? <laughs> Things turned out well. <laughs> <laughs> New me might go back and put some shit in old me head and fuck everything up. <laughs> you don't want that butterfly effect. Go back and go, everything's going to be fine, relax. And then I go on and I go, I want to talk about tulips. <laughs> <laughs> what about somebody else then somebody somebody else about to do their first time would you have any advice for them they're, they're, you know, they're in a preparation stage to have a date I will walk up to them and say you should not let anybody like me or anyone else come up to this close to you and put anything in your head before you go on stage <laughs> well I guess that's your, that's your first gig thank you very much for talking thank to you, us sir. alrighty then folks there we go you know he doesn't get paid by the hour. Short and sweet, in and out. I like it. Thank you so much for joining me today on the My First Gig podcast. Three episodes down, more to come in this series, some great guests. If you haven't already, follow me at My First Gig Pod, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, my personal page at Dwayne Dugan, where you can see what I'm up to. If you're in Dublin, if you're a local, come come see me perform. Cherry Comedy every week, the International Comedy Club every week, and then some other places in between. I'm recording interviews this week. More interviews come up this week for later in this series. So I want you to tweet me your fast question of the day. I don't want it to be comedy related. I want it to be fun. I want it to be silly. A one sentence question that has a one sentence answer that you want to know from whoever I'm speaking to. And then hopefully I might pick your question. I might put it to comedian. Comedian doesn't know the question. You don't know the comedian until you see it send in your question of the day and subscribe write a review got a few reviews already and would love some more it all helps trying to get this across the line we're still at early doors yet so i've said it every week and i'm sorry if you've tuned out already your help is how this grows you know i did actually i must say i was just joking last week when i said that everybody dropped off after the James A. Caster interview and didn't listen to my outro at all. Well, no, I wasn't joking about that. That was very much a fact. The stats prove that. The stats pretty much say, who cares what you're going to see, baby? And I, I said that last week. And the retention during that period was a lot bigger. Now, I don't know if I had something more interesting to say or people actually felt guilted into it. But look, hope you stuck around today. I'm going to chat to you at the top and the bottom of these podcasts. If you want to skip it, you know, I do it on some podcasts. Some of my stick is, you know, it might be fun. Might say something interesting. Might be giving away a prize. Who wants a bar of chocolate? Right. I'm going to send a bar of chocolate to someone, your favorite bar of chocolate. Follow at my first gig and just with no other sentence, tell me your favorite bar of chocolate. And I'm going to send it to you. Let's see if that works. If your favorite bar of chocolate isn't sold here in Ireland, then I'm going to send you my least favorite bar of chocolate. So, think about it. I'm Dwayne Dugan. Follow me at Dwayne Dugan. My first gig pod. At my first gig pod. Another episode next week. If you haven't listened to the back episodes, we've got, we got James A. Caster and Ardla Hannan. Two great interviews. Both available now. It's all free. Tune in. Subscribe. And we'll see you next week for more My First Gig. Thank you, guys. It's the My First Gig Pod.